Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. So let me start, as promised, with a brief introduction to meditation. What is meditation? It seems that human beings, we, are the only intelligent species on this planet that has a problem with its own identity. We put ourselves into the distant past, into some gardens where everything was fine. And when we got chased out of those gardens and everything broke, or we have to sit under some trees to attain enlightenment, and this has been going on for thousands of years. So we are trying to find who we truly are instead of recognizing what we actually are without thinking, without making anything. So meditation means we attain our true nature, not just personally, as you could hear from the intro, but also for each other, with each other. So meditation means that you turn your energy inwards and you find the answer within. The moment you find the answer within, it's obvious on the outside. When Buddha Shakyamuni woke up, he saw that everybody is potentially enlightened. Everybody, everything is a potential Buddha. But if we don't get there, then we don't attain it personally. As a great yogi said, the only way out is the way in. So you have to look inside and answer one question in order to answer 10,000 questions on the outside. Meditation is not a technique. If you have a glass of water or a jug of water or a pitcher of water or a can of water, it doesn't matter what holds the water as long as you can drink. So in terms of meditation technique, it really does not matter what technique you use although every single tradition has its own specific inventory what techniques we teach. But the most important factor of meditation is awakening. How do we wake up? We have 10,000 ways just to make one point, just to attain one thing. In our tradition, we have three major techniques and within that some sub-variations. The first technique seems to be the lightest, Perceive sound and space. As you're sitting here, please take a relatively upright and autonomous position. You can put your hands into the Mahamudra, which is like a bird's nest before your navel. The men are advised to have the left hand over the right, and the ladies reverse right hand over the left. And put this against your lower belly. Pull the blades of the hand inside that it touches your stomach but you can rest the lower arms on your thighs. The eyes are a slit open. The eyeballs look down 45 degrees. Don't look at one point, but rather relax your eye gaze. And please do not shut your eyes completely. If you completely shut your eyes, then you're going into your own personal movie theater. And watching your own frontal cortex movies is not really meditation. It's self-entertainment, sometimes self-indulgence, and sometimes self-deception, because we believe those movies. So stay with the breath, stay with the posture, and perceive sound and space right here, right now. If you practice this for some time, you can get to what we call not moving mind. This not moving mind is essential, like a membrane, like a surface to reflect and perceive. Anything that takes you away from this moment, from this perception, is just karma. Don't judge it. Don't worry about it. Don't have high hopes about it. Just let that disappear. Whatever appears will disappear. That's the law of karma. Do not check it. Don't hold it. Don't identify with it. Keep your mind clear like space, clear like a mirror. This is the first technique. And we'll be spending a few minutes with this. Thank you very much. We've had a few teachers appearing in the last two, three minutes. One of them was the thunder, one of them was the aircraft, and one of them was the ceiling fan. These are all sounds that you can latch onto. And don't hear it just with your ears. Let that sink down to your tantian. The Tantian, your navel chakra, is the focus of attention during any kind of Zen meditation. 
whether it's the direct perception of sound and space, or what we're going to practice next, the question, the great question that we ask. Why the Tantian? We have this very interesting psychophysical system called sentient being, that's us, with the software, our soul, including our mind, and our body, that's the hardware. If you get to the point where you can clear all the previous information by yourself, you're doing yourself a great favor. Focusing on your Tantian does just that. When you're here, your attention is in your lower belly, then the upper three chakras, the three major centers, they get relieved from all the stress and pressure. The Buddha says in the Dhammapada, thoughts cannot extinguish thoughts. Emotions cannot extinguish emotions. And when you focus on the Tantian, then you attain a state of mind and energy together, which is before thinking, before appearance, before the major centers created emotions, speech, thoughts, or the sensory perceptions got fired up by your energy. So it's a state of relative calmness, unmoving, unbecoming, unborn and undying. If you focus on the Tantian, that's what you get. The Koreans spoke about three kinds of energy. Wongi, the original energy that you bring with yourself. That's what powers you individually. Some people have more of it, some people have less of it. Either way, our own configuration makes us different from the rest of the world. The energy of the environment, the universe as we see it, is called Deigi, or great energy. They call it Dei, great, because it's much bigger than us. And interestingly enough, the link between Wongi and Deigi is breathing, Kongi, okay, empty energy. And when you combine the three, and you just watch your breath, and not make a wall of your own karma, you don't create an ego that is standing between you and the world, you and the other person. Then these energies combine. And when Wongi, Deigi, and Kongi become one, it's called Hapki, or unified, harmonized energy. And as a sideline note, that's where Aikido or Hapkido is from. When you combine these three energies, that's the operational experience of oneness. The good news is we do not have to be separated from the rest of the world or each other. We can experience this fundamental connectedness, this oneness with the rest of the world. That does not erase our individuality, but it brings it to clarity, balance, compassion, and wisdom. Now, how do we find that? We can ask this question, what is this that sees with my eyes? hears with my ears, feels with my heart, thinks with my mind, and ultimately says I in English, ich in German, ein in Hungarian. What is that? Where does that come from? So keep the question simple. All the other techniques are the same. Every in-breath, please ask, what is this? And at the out-breath, let the mind relax. Let, let the mind kind of regurgitate any kind of karma, identification, idea. Inside you have total freedom, but freedom with focus, freedom with presence. Don't follow your karma where it would take you. So keep the breathing relaxed and totally quiet. Do not impose any rhythm on it. Observe your body position, including your Mahamudra, that's the hand gesture focusing on your Tantian. And inside, ask the question, what is this? Do not believe any answers. Those answers are neither good nor bad, but it's not you. It's your product. And the factory never equals the product, although it bears full responsibility for it and has the freedom to create any product it wishes, okay? If you practice this really continuously, then sometime later, anywhere between six months, one year, two years, depending on your effort, 
You can arrive at a state of mind when there's no more answers coming, just the question remaining. And that's one of the goals, one of the stations where we have to get to. So now again, please turn your attention inwards. And for a few minutes, let us practice this technique called the great question. Thank you very much. Remember tonight's meditation instructions and practices like these little cheese cubes in a big store. We're not buying the whole pound or the entire box, but we have these little snacks. Okay, so you had a snack of the great question right now. And uh, if you practice this more, then you actually get to the point of it, which is attaining clarity and oneness. This is not an abstraction. It's realizing our potential. All those fruits or results that we wish, wisdom, compassion, receiving and giving selfless help, come from this point. If we attain this point, we attain our true nature and feel genuinely connected. If we remain behind our own walls, then we always be isolated. We'll be alone. We are lonely. We feel sometimes desperate or too tense, okay? We call that energy imbalance. When you're lonely and depressed, your energy is lower than the environment. When you are tense and you're ready to charge and attack, your energy is higher than the environment. And when you meditate, then mentally and physically, you can balance this out. This balance is important. Being clear, being balanced, does not mean that you are flatlining. You have emotional and cognitive responses. You feel joy and pain. You are a complete human being, but without delusions, without attachments, without false identifications. As we used to say in Europe, you can only lose your chains and illusions on the path. Nothing more. And let us try the third method, which is the strongest. It's called the mantra practice. Mantra practice has three important aspects. One is that it protects the mind from its own harmful influence. Sometimes we are our own worst enemies because we make ourselves afraid, deluded, lustful, angry, greedy, and that's all our reaction to something or someone or an environment. So when you practice the mantra, it acts like a firewall. The signal comes through, but your reaction doesn't go into your layer of identity. It doesn't get projected to your environment. So it's protection, protects you, protects your environment from your reactive mind, from your spontaneous, dualistic, good and bad maker. And it's very important. Sometimes your own reaction does more harm than the initial mistake to which it is reacting. The second important aspect of the mantra is that it creates a value system, a hierarchy inside your mind. Every mantra has some meaning. Either it's compassion or wisdom or enlightenment, something in some traditional language. And if you use that regularly, then naturally that comes to the top of your own totem pole inside your mind. That will be the strongest wolf of the pack. So if you put something to the top of your priority list, chances are you will realize that first. You put most of your energy into that. And that's why it's good to have some sort of chanting practice because that does the job inside. If you are not structured, if you are not having a value system, then someone else will do that for you. Someone else will tell you who you are, what is most important, what to do with your life. Well, we are autonomous, capable human beings. We can do just that for ourselves. And the third and most important aspect is that moment to moment, mantra practice helps you distinguish the noise from the signal. So if your hierarchy is clear, if you are free from harmful reactive influence, 
Then the third is moment to moment distinguish between signal and noise. So now you're listening to me, and that's wonderful. You're not listening to the bike that just passed outside in the distance. So that's the mind's completely clear and spontaneous selective function. You can take that to the next level, that you would not be distracted by anything, anyone, irrelevant, okay? And for that, mantra practice is great because it brings you back to this moment. In order to have uh, another snack of this kind, the Dharma snack, let us practice this mantra, very simple, Om Nam. Is the universe, Om, in its purity, Nam. You can put your hands together or just leave it in your lap. And seven times, let us recite together these two syllables and uh, be brave and put energy into it. Then it has some punch. Om These three methods, they have different strength. Having a mantra which has a beginning and an end and you can put it on closed loop is like anchoring a boat both at the bow and the stern. When your waves are very high, your sea is very stormy, you have high karmic winds, it's good to have a mantra that you are used to. It's good to go to your bay, your safe marina, and bow, anchor, anchor the boat at bow and the stern. The question is just one anchor, let's say at the stern, and that's it. You have just one point, not a loop, but one point. And perception of sound and space is no anchor. You don't need it. You're just standing at the wheel, and the captain knows where to go, Direction is okay, winds are fantastic, you can open all the sails and go. But sometimes we have high seas, we have uh, karmic peaks uh, or lows, and then we need help. And of course, we can get help from the outside many times, uh, from a friend, from a group, from a book, from an image. But all of that should help us realize our own potential, that from the problem we could become the solution. From just a sentient being, we could become a clear, autonomous, helpful human. That's our great way. We can all cover this distance. The Buddha's message, as I got started at the beginning of these instructions, is that every single being can attain enlightenment. Every single one of us can become a bodhisattva, thus becoming the solution instead of staying, remaining the problem. I think that's plenty for introductory. And now I would kindly welcome your questions, any kind of questions. On the second one, you had the question, what is it? What is this, yes. Or what is this, okay. I probably shouldn't ask what the this is, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a legitimate question. Okay. This question, what is this, directly points to our mind, our true nature. Zen has four principles. Do not depend on the scriptures. 
directly pointing to human mind. Attaining our true self means we become awakened and transmission from mind to mind. So the second of this is manifesting in this question. We are directly pointing to human mind, our true nature. The original teaching goes like this. Whether you are sitting, standing, walking, or lying down, talking in silence, dreaming, or being awake, constantly, without interruption, what is this? Interestingly enough, if you practice this consistently, then all your ideas about yourself will appear. And whatever appears and disappears is not your true nature. That's why I instructed you to let that appear and disappear. And don't touch it. Through lifetimes, we are taught and we also make our own ideas who we are. Most of that is at best partially true, but mostly it's untrue. So if we follow the wrong sense of identity, we are ignorant. And out of that ignorance comes greed and anger and all these unnecessary and unwholesome consequences. Reverse the equation. If you experience greed, anger, unwholesome states of mind, then you really don't know who you are. You haven't attained that. And if you clean that up, then this bad karma also disappears. That's why we direct the question inside. We don't believe anything that appears and disappears. We don't attach to it, and least of all would we identify with it. And then we can become free. Thank you. You're welcome. I, uh, I am so enlightened hearing you because I noted the similarity. I was born a Hindu. So we have the Namaste. Pranamaya Kosha, yeah, the Annamaya Kosha, and the Manamaya Kosha, and the Pranamaya Kosha, and that you identify the breath connection between the, in, the inside and the rest of us. And that is exactly what we learn there also. But the thing that I recognize is that we are soul on a journey. So do you be, profess to believe in reincarnation or not? That's a question that comes up because what am I? I'm, I? I believe that I'm soul on a journey, that I've been here before and I will come again. And I'd like to know what your viewpoint on that is. I have good news for you. Zen does not depend on reincarnation either. Of course we recognize it. Of course, we have it incorporated in our teaching. But we do not expect people to believe that there's rebirth. If they only work with this life, even just this life can be made much better by practicing Zen. I have students who are Catholics, materialists, some of them from uh, Arabic countries, some of them from Korea, some of them from China, America, many worldviews. I don't expect them to believe in reincarnation, but if they have that kind of experience, and based on that, they believe that, of course we work with it. But what we need to see is that reincarnation is also karma. It's also relative phenomenon. That means if we make it, we have it. If we don't make reincarnation, then we don't have it. It's not about the concept. It's not about cognizing it, thinking it. It's about the soul continuing on the samsaric journey. You stop that journey, reincarnation stops. So it doesn't exist by itself. It's not our destiny. Like in the West, we are created by God or some higher entity. Millions of people believe that, that we are actually just created and maybe to the image of the creator or with a divine spark in us, but we are created, that's it. And we have some sort of destiny. Zen offers you a way to wake up to this ultimate reality that everything is created by mind alone. So if you make it, you have it. If you don't make it, you don't have it. You have a strong sense of individuality then your I, my, me is going around, 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 lifetime after lifetime. But the Buddha's teaching is that if you extinguish all the energy and take away the information, the sense of a separate ego, then reincarnation stops. The migration stops. It's possible to become free from the wheel of life and death. In a Hinduism, if I'm not mistaken, there's also the concept of moksha or mukti. And that awakening can be earned 
uh, not just by sacrifice to the gods, but controlling yourself. And it's the path of yoga. And through that path, which is actually very similar in the method to some aspects of Buddhism, you can get there. So when we talk about the mind before dualities or before thinking, then if you read the sutras of Patanjali and Vyasa as the commentary, then there is a term called niroda. Niroda is the suspension of the dualistic activity of the mind. That's where your self as a separate ego does not exist because you don't make that, you don't create that. But there's a lot of previous steps. And if you look at the eight levels of yoga, it's very important to start at the very beginning, the yama, the niyama, the pranayama, and the asana, and then the upper four can actually happen. When I said turn your energy inwards and ask the question or observe the sounds or do the mantra, it's actually corresponding to the fifth and sixth level, which is the pratyahara, don't attach to the extra perceptions or the external perceptions and turn your energy inwards. And when you keep just one mind object, there's the dharana. You keep just one object of the mind, and that's it. And that trains you to be focused. And then the seventh is jhana. Jhana literally means Zen. When it went to China, it became channa, then chan, son in Korean, and Zen in Japanese. So it's actually the literal translation of the seventh level. And samadhi is the eighth, complete oneness. I think that brings it home for you. Thank you very much. This is where I become confused because essentially wasn't the Buddha saying we're just a bunch of nothing that decided to be something? He and didn't along say that. the way we were accumulating experiences? Or? You should read Winnie the Pooh. Winnie okay. the Pooh is an excellent <laughs> sutra. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's a series of kongans as Winnie the Pooh enters situations and mm -hmm. relationships. And one of these kongans is when he visits Rabbit on a beautiful, balmy Sunday morning. He knocks at Rabbit's door, and that Rabbit knows that this means the total depletion of milk and honey from her pantries. It's gone. <laughs> so she, as Rabbit, employs an evasive maneuver. Hey, hello, is there anybody home? Rabbit says, no, nobody. You know, Winnie the Pooh, he is not really rocket science here, so says, hmm, that doesn't add up. Nobody cannot say nobody. In order to say nobody, there has to be somebody. Who is that? Says, Rabbit, that's you. No. She went to visit Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> but that's me. Rabbit, let me in. So nothing cannot say nothing. Remember that. Rather, ask the question instead of logical conclusions, where does this notion come from? My own speech, where does that come from? Because the question opens up the mind. Definitions, they give borders. Dogmas put it into prison. So ask the right question. The right question, where does this come from? Nothing, something, all illusory. Even physics proved that there is no complete vacuum. And a thing never exists completely isolated from its own environment. It's not just in the law of thermodynamics, it's also in the Buddha Dharma. It's called interdependence. Okay. When you look at these logical conclusions which the Western mind produces in abundance, take it with a pinch of salt. Don't believe your own thinking. I've seen a wonderful bumper sticker, okay? Don't believe everything you think. It's a godsend, okay? More questions? So you talk about Buddhism and there's Zen Buddhism and you teach Zen. Can you talk about Zen Buddhism as opposed to other forms of Buddhism? As opposed to, I can't. Okay, as Impossible. part of. <laughs> can you no. explain Zen? No. But I can ask you a good question. What color is this cabinet behind me? White. You attain Zen. So when your mind is clear, then you see clearly, hear clearly, taste, smell, touch, think, feel, etc. clearly. Right here, right now. In Zen, we talk about substance. That's where all these three forms of practice 
are directed. If you attain substance, you attain the mind which is before thinking. When you hear the sound, for one second, everything is deleted from your mind because you cannot keep your computer running. There was a stronger signal. It erased your dualistic karma or habits for one second. We call that substance, although it has no name, no form. That's why we don't readily make statues or having absolute ideas about it. Okay. Yeah, tradition makes a lot of Buddha statues and we have a lot of teaching and sutras, but that's not it. It's just expedient means to point at this. If you attain this substance, your mind becomes clear like space, clear like a mirror. Then you perceive truth. Right here, right now, your mind is clear. Third step, you function correctly. And this function is essential to help all beings, including ourselves. So when somebody is hungry, give that person food. Somebody is thirsty, give that person drink. Sounds very simple, almost childish. But look at your own life. How many times do we want to give only food to thirsty people? Because we want to know better. That's why our own arrogance is the biggest hindrance. So Zen means you attain all these three, substance, truth, and function. And once you've done that, your life becomes simpler without losing any quality and clearer without losing any of your important relationships, connections, and activities. But it stops being selfish. It stops being limited. We have uprooted and cleaned out the roots of ignorance, greed, and anger. That's how Zen or absorption or oneness works. As I have explained earlier, this state of one mind that has no self, that has no other, that has no name and no form. Why is this important? Because it establishes a baseline. This baseline is called by the sixth patriarch originally nothing. But we have to truly understand this nothing not to fall into nihilism. Originally, nothing means that everything is created by mind alone. Attaining that is Zen. Then we can create correct life. We can live together harmoniously with each other and with Mother Earth. We can all do that. So this clarity, insight, wisdom, compassion, selfless help, it's all part of the package. But without this one point, the mind without thinking, without dualities, it's not working. The last couple of thousand years is a very good demonstration. More questions? I'm talking about meditation. You said keep the eyes open a little bit. Yes. So you look down or are you looking up? Down. In fact, because if what I've learned is, you know, that's the... That's another school. That's fine. Looking up and the other school incorporates that into the technique. That's okay. Right. In Zen, we have the stantian focus, which means you lower the eye gaze in order to return the energy to the tantian and not having it come up on the frontal part of the body. Oh, so you're taking it to the Manipur yes. chakra, right? Yeah, the Manipur eye. Yeah. So yeah. Down, 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 down. And if your system is sensitive, you can even feel when the angle is right, your tantian gets stronger. Okay. By the way, since you are from India, or you originally your karma was there, if you look at Buddha statues, all of them have the eyes slit open. Yeah. That's why. You don't 100% close the eyes. I know, because I tend to close it all the way. But Of course, I we know. want to relax. But yeah. if we relax too much, yeah. then because we turn on to. channel one, channel two, <laughs> channel three, multi-room theater forever. Just, Aren't Please. you supposed to look for the light? That's what I concentrate on. If you meditate correctly, you don't have to look for the light because it appears by itself. Right, that's what I mean. But if you look for appears, the light, you become dependent on photons. Don't depend on photons. If you look for it, then you and the light no, remain separate. No, you're not separate. looking for it, but when I go deeper, then I feel a light. That's then, different. Okay. That light appears and disappears. Not good, not bad. Just don't attach to it. Because that... I find that like a focus, something to focus on. All right, bring that down to your tantian, then it doesn't okay. occupy your chakras here Otherwise, and here. Otherwise, like you said, my, the thoughts keep oh, yeah. churning up. It can so become then a if I can terrible traffic on. jam. Oh, I know. Thank you.
Uh, when I mentioned reincarnation, the objective really is not to be born again. In Hinduism. Seriously? No? You just want to get out of here? That's, we want to be done. So this we want to stay with life. God. Why not come back to Sarasota? No, but who wants to I go through the, the hassle of living over and over again? You know, you're done with it. You know, you become one with God. You plant the dust under his feet. That's what we believe by moksha to be. Seriously? So, this is the last time you married her? That's it? Well, uh, we believe in karma, that there was karma from before uh -huh. that brought us together. And at the end of this, we'll have a balance of karma. If the karma goes down to zero, then we become one with God. Fantastic. What's next? You became one with God. What's next? What about all your friends who still haven't become one with the Atma Brahman? Mm -hmm. Their journey? Don't you want to help them? Yes, I can come back and help them. You can come back? Yes. Fantastic. That's what we do. <laughs> Consciously reincarnating for a specific purpose without the bad homework. <laughs> Finish your homework, then come back for another reason than paying back for your bad karma. See you next lifetime, too. Thank you. <laughs> uh, suppose you lived in a country where the leader of the country, instead of creating harmony, created nothing but divisiveness and suffering. What You'd country could that be? <laughs> I, I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay. Go on. I'll answer your um, question. People have different ideas and techniques for personally dealing with the aggravation. What do you do yourself? I go to Area 51, and I actually find that anybody divisive, sowing the seeds of greed and anger and supremacy and disharmony, is actually not a human being. It's an alien. That alien is stored in Area 51 in formaldehyde and launched at the world at several intervals. That's why some of these aliens cannot really speak English correctly. They have these really specific problems of connecting to human beings because they're not really human. They are from a very, very different planet where this is the new norm for them, not for us. But there is a system, we call it voting system, that can actually help. So next year, ladies and gentlemen, be very careful. I'll edit this out anyway, so I'm totally free to say what I want. And uh, as well as I uh, kind of convey my sympathies, I have to say that this man is just a consequence, not the origin of the problem. So the mindset that created this figure as a symbol for their own willpower, that mindset is the problem. So we have to really be clear with each other to have correct situation, correct relationship, and correct function, how we cooperate, that this mindset would disappear. He's a phenomenon. He's an appearance. He's not the direct cause. Without a strong background support and background, I would say, mass of people, this phenomenon could not have appeared. So make sure that you don't get to the state of the Roman Empire where Nero just burnt it all. Next question. A number of years ago, I was studying a book called A Course in Miracles. And uh, in it, it sounded kind of Buddhist when I was reading it. And one of the daily lessons was, I do not know the meaning of anything I see. It's kind of sound like the one meditation where you're asking that question or something. It, are you interested in miracles? No, it's a miracle um, change of mind. That's the miracle. We are on the same page then. Yeah, okay. So the Course in Miracles is actually a course in ordinariness. And this ordinariness is the greatest miracle, that we recognize this simple and clear being who we truly are. Not what we think we are, not what we desire to be, not we are afraid of to be, but what we truly are. What is the greatest miracle? I let you answer that question for yourself. I don't take away your homework. But what you make, you get. If you point something, someone as the greatest miracle in your life, that will rule your life. Choose carefully. More questions? Uh, the meaning of Nama again, Om Nama. Om Nam. Om is the universe, you know that, and Nam is pure. 
the universe in its purity. And when you chant and you only focus on the mantra without thinking, that moment the universe is pure because you don't defile it with your own dualistic ideas, wrong views, greed and anger. That's why it's the universe in its purity. So what language would that be? It's actually Sanskrit, Nam, not Nama. Nam. 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 Because Nama is bow. Nama is taking refuge in, yeah. in that language. So like, that's why I was Om confused. Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Namah. Shivaya. Yeah, that's okay. what, that's yeah, but it's just Nam, N-A-M, that's it. Okay. By the way, the Shiva mantra, you're friends with that, or if not, you should be. I okay? Am. You are. Great, thank you. Okay. You mentioned uh, Patanjali. I did. And the He's one of my favorite. Eightfold Path. So the similarities between uh, the Buddhist teachings, the Four Noble Truths, and the Eightfold Path, and Patanjali, uh, similarities and differences? I have to edit that a little bit. Mahayana Buddhism and yoga practice, they have parallel methods. But the eight levels of yoga and the Noble Eightfold Path they are not really similar in terms. I've just said the eight levels of yoga, but the Noble Eightfold Path is like correct view, correct speech, correct action, correct livelihood, correct meditation, correct attainment. So it's also a nice structure. It's very important to follow that. But the eight levels of yoga is really like a meditation methodology. Very clear foundation, like if you, don't follow the yama and the niyama, then you do stupid things and you don't do what's necessary. And uh, the Noble Eightfold Path in Buddhism is very, very important. But how would we know what is correct if the mind is not clear? In fact, the Noble Eightfold Path in Mahayana Buddhism doesn't just have eight parts. It has 10,000 parts. Correct sitting, correct speech, correct work, Everything goes back to the Noble Eightfold Path, but you can add more if you so wish, like correct contracts, if you're a contractor. What is correct? If your mind is clear, you can always see what is correct. Every single part of the Noble Eightfold Path begins with correct. Find that. That's what meditation can give you. Okay? Thank you. You're welcome. More questions? Is it important to understand a mantra to use it? At least once, yes. That means you read it in your own native tongue or a third language that you can understand at least once so that it would connect to your intellect. Because the intellect is hungry. We are very curious. We don't like mambo jumbo. We want to make sure that we're not reciting the wrong mantra, okay? So it's it very clear that we want to know and we have the right to know. But when you recite the mantra in its original language, you don't have to juxtapose the English version and you run it parallel. You don't have to. Once you have read it, it gets kind of transcoded in your subconscious and even if you do it just in the original language, it happens inside. Now, one more step and I'm not asking you to believe me. Even without the intellectual knowledge, the understanding, it happens inside, exactly in the same way as you would know it. I give you an example. During our retreat yesterday and the day before yesterday in the ordinary Zen Sangha, we recited the great compassion dharani. It's everywhere in Mahayana Buddhism. From Tibet to Japan to Indochina to China, Korea, the great compassion dharani is there because it actually generates compassion inside even if you don't understand the words. When I got started in Hungary in 1990, September, I had many unresolved questions, a very, very volatile and uh, unsettled mind. And I went to the Sangha and we chanted the Heart Sutra in Korean, in Hungarian, and then we chanted the Great Dharani. The Heart Sutra I understood but it didn't have any meaning for me because of the structure and uh, many no, 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 neither, 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 nor, nor, nor. So the, the Heart Sutra was in the language that I understood, but it didn't make any sense. Not then. The Great Dharani, I didn't understand a word of it. 
But as I recited it, I became more peaceful. I distinctly remember the feeling. And I rested in that peace of mind for a long time after the first recital. And I said, if there's nothing more than this tradition can give me, I'm very grateful just for this. If there's nothing else that I can get from here, I'm already grateful. So I kept reciting the great Dharani more and more and more, including the six years in Korea, including a 100-day solo retreat in Korea, where for many hours a day I recited it, and I still did not have a clue what it meant, literally. In the Korean tradition, when you read that mantra in the books, it says, no translation, and it goes from beginning to end. But I'm sorry, I have a degree of linguistics, so I can structure text. And if the signals, i.e. the words, have a systematic distribution, it means there was a mind that arranged those words, those morphemes in that pattern. That pattern has a message. It's the meaning of the mantra. So I knew I would find it somewhere. It so happens that in 2002, 3, and 4, I did some teaching in Malaysia. Somebody brought a handout from a Buddhist lecture, and it's called Known Dharanis. And it was written down in Sanskrit, and I recognized it, because the Namo Radhana Dharayaya Namakarya Baru Gijese Baraya Sabaha, that's part of the mantra, in Sanskrit, it goes like this, Namak Aryavalokiteshvaraya, Bodhisattvaya, Mahasattvaya, etc. So suddenly, it started to be kind of sensible. So it really started to make sense. But I still did not know the English meaning. So the guy says, oh, you're interested in it. Of course I am. Then he brought me the whole package, four or five Dharanis, including the Shurangama, the Nilakanta, and other Dharanis. Turns out, that they're way before Buddhism. In fact, they are rooted in some Hindu and other past of those countries where these Dharanis appeared. And we took a trip to the Cameron Highlands in Malaysia. And if you haven't been there, it's highly recommended. It's beautiful. There is a temple called Sambosa, the temple of the three treasures at the edge of the highlands in a city called Tanarata, very close to that. And in that temple, of course, as in most Chinese temples, there is the free distribution material with many nice booklets and sutras and chants and whatnot. And there, as usual, I look through that shelf, what I can take, what I can appreciate. And there is this booklet with Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva on the cover. And I open it, and the great Dharani is there in Sanskrit, Chinese, and English. And then my mind went, boom, totally on fire. For 20 minutes, I was walking in the courtyard and matching the words. As it was like this burning satisfaction that finally I got what I wanted, all right? And then the high passed, and I came back to normal in terms of this joy and the elated passion that finally I got the meaning. And we went back to Kuala Lumpur, to the temple, and I was kind of uh, bouncing with joy for the next couple of days from time to time. Then we returned to the normal practice that I'm still doing in Hungary. And the feeling of the great Dharani remained exactly the same as in the previous 12 years. <laughs> returned to exactly the same energy print, the same effect on my mind. But I knew the meaning, so my intellect, like the hungry dog, was already <laughs> satisfied. That's it. Excellent. Thank you so, so much. So feed the dog the right food, <laughs> but then don't check. Okay. <laughs> You're welcome. What caused you to decide to become a Zen priest? If I may say I'm a Zen monk, How? although I may appear Zen priestly. Zen master, whatever. How Zen long did it take you to, to get there? Zen given to you. That's fortunately not my decision. Zen monk, that came from the inside. I don't think people can stay in this form of, of existence if they are not really rooted inside. When I was 26, a year after Zen Master Sung San visited Hungary, I had a class at university. I was a fresh graduate, and we had to study methodology, how to teach English as a second language. Folks, that's, that was really interesting. And the class was over. I was waiting for my girlfriend to come. And then 
in that half an hour, I was just looking out at the courtyard of the school. No one there. Kids already left, went home. White gravel, cloudless blue sky, these tall and narrow hickory trees, you know, growing just tall, and the wind fluttering the leaves, this distinct shh sound. In that moment, seemingly out of nowhere, there was this very soft, clear sentence inside, how wonderful it would be to become monk this lifetime, full stop. That still is there, never ran out of it. Did you do meditation before that? Yes, I did. And how many years? A year and a half to two. How did you start doing meditation? Friends advice. What made you start? You want to do meditation? Yeah, I, like I said, I started in 1990 at a friend's advice. I was really confused, and I didn't find answers to my questions in my own culture, at least none that I could believe. By then, I was educated enough to know what psychology, philosophy, science, and religion would tell me. My late uncle on my mother's side was an Adventist priest. My father, may him rest in peace, he was a medical professor. My mother, living her wonderful senior years now, she's a pediatrician. So we had science and religion in the family, both. But none of them, whether it was a family member or someone in the faculty at the university, could give me a satisfactory answer to my question. And that came from one realization. As we are here, we are playing a role. Playing a role doesn't mean it's artificial or insincere. Now, you play the role of audience. I play the role of teacher. But as we leave, if we decide to get together for coffee, these roles disappear. And we are just human beings drinking coffee together. You go back home to your husband, immediately you become the wife. You see your children, you are the mother. But when you're at the hairdresser, the mother and the wife disappears, and you have just your lady friends sitting, you know, getting their hair done. Rolls after rolls after rolls. It's like on an infinite stage. Who is the director? What is it that decides what kind of role you play? And if you are 100% identified with one role, why is it a hindrance to playing another? So I had these questions. That was the director inside of me? What's my role in society, i.e., what is the purpose of my life? And I was too smart to settle with one answer. I really didn't know. And I really needed some clear grounding not to be lost in the multitude of thinking and emotions. I wanted to find my own director. I wanted to make sense of this theater, of this world outside. And when I got to this teaching by Zen Master Sung San, and we learned this primary point. That's where the door of the director opens, okay? That particular room. And that's when I felt I'm on the right path. So that's why I'm still here after almost 30 years. Last two questions. Is there a way that we can do small incremental practices just to keep in tune during the day when monkey mind takes over and yes yes in fact in daily life especially in lay life you do nothing but that that's why everybody is advised gently to do some meditation every morning and uh, some mantra some sitting and if you're into bowing practice that's also very good and you tune in for the day and it's not just your to-do list that appears in your mind during meditation there's some more benefits to that, okay? So I suggest that as you give your own body a shower in the morning, give your mind some clarity as well. Tune in for the day. Don't just crash in the street. And as you meditate, your mind becomes totally aware, not just what you're going to do on that day, but what is it or who is it that's doing it. And you can prepare for some tough encounters. You can change outcomes. And uh, that's what we call daily maintenance. If you do that, then karma does not accumulate so easily. You don't kind of go into the weekend with this big headache. Oh my God, what have I done in the last six days? Terrible. So you just don't let the dust settle. You don't let homework accumulate. You do that day by day. 
we all know that this daily maintenance is not enough. If you want to go deeper, if you want to develop, then it's important to go for retreats. That's when you get out of your comfort zone, out of the family environment, and you go to the group, the Sangha, and you have direct interaction with the teacher, and then you can develop. Uh, in lay life, most of our environment, human relationship-wise, is focused on two things. Your significant other, if you're living as a couple, or your family, because these relationships you know, beget children. And then couple relationship, we call it dual karma, becomes family karma because there's offsprings. These are the two main boxes where we are most of the time. Of course, when you get to your peer group, your friends, that's what we call group karma because it's not bonded by blood relationships. But the dharma is practiced in a group called sangha. Sangha is a specific group where we practice meditation or some form of awakening. And we need that. We need that because our individual karma as a self, as a person, cannot be cleaned up just by ourselves or by our significant other or by the family only. We need the group too. And that's why retreats are necessary. That's why sometimes really falling silent and not entertaining any dualistic thinking, returning to yourself, it's really necessary to go deeper. And uh, you can see the results. Those people who go for retreats regularly, they live a very different life. Yeah, it's here. It's in the same environment. But mentally, it's not the same path. You, go, you don't go through the same afflictions. You don't follow the same reactions. You don't subscribe to the same patterns, i.e. you are not deluded as much as those who do not practice and let their filters become walls. We all filter reality. That's fine, but is our filter clear? Do we know that we are doing it? So retreats is probably the best thing that you can do besides daily maintenance. And then you can see the results, especially when you do not make the typical mistakes that you used to. Then you know your karma has changed. Thank you. You're welcome. Last question. So do you think you can meditate in other ways besides yes, sitting? Yes, of like course. Walking maybe or drawing or yes. some other activity? Two kinds of meditation. One is what we call object-oriented meditation. Like uh, if you draw... If you drive, if you do something, do it 100% without distraction. Mm -hmm. And that one mind with that object is complete. Mm -hmm. In Zen, we call it just do it. When you cook, just cook. Yeah. When you talk, just talk. Yeah. No layers of checking, making, holding, doubting, second guessing, <laughs> no. Cause and effect, very clear. Situation, relationship, function, very clear. Mm -hmm. We call that object-oriented meditation. It's fine. But to distinguish the mirror from its object, that it wouldn't get stuck on it, we have to do sometimes the objectless meditation. And that's what we have tasted tonight. So both are important. So 24 hours a day, complete awareness. When you sleep, just sleep. OK? <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your precious attention tonight. Uh, thank you, Don and Paul, for having me here. And I hope that tonight's Dharma talk has been another step for all of us to attain awakening and save all beings from suffering. Thank you very much.